Hey, folks, if you're just joining, we're going to give it a few more minutes while people drop in. We see attendees uh, still dropping in here, but uh, just give us a couple minutes and we'll get started. For those who just for those who just joined or are joining, we will be getting started at about two or three minutes after the hour. Hey there, Bart. Great to see you there in the audience. Uh, we'll get started very very shortly. Hey, Daryl, do you want to make sure that the chat is enabled for everybody? I'm just not exactly sure if it is. I think, okay, let me, although I would prefer if you have, if just folks, I'll turn on the chat. Let me just go and, uh, how do I do that with? But yeah, if you, if you have any questions, uh, definitely put them in the Q&A section for us so that we, uh, we can capture them. Yeah, it might be too late to turn the chat on, but the Q&A is, uh, okay. if it's not already on, I'm just looking at the options I'm seeing right now. Folks, if you're just, uh, if you're just joining, um, we'll get started in about one minute. Chat. Okay, I'm going to turn the chat on so that people can chat to the host and panelists, that being Christine, Laura, and myself. Um, oh, Nikki Hickman says chat is already working. Thank you very much. All right, let's get started here. Just going to share my screen again. So welcome, folks. It's uh, I'm real excited to talk about a project we've been working on in the background for some time. I've been watching a project here, and it's getting... To the point of uh, more uh, of a reality, which is always an exciting, exciting stage. So a quick uh, rundown on who's here. Well, I'm Daryl O'Donnell, I'm the CEO of, of Continuum Loop. Uh, Christine is joining us. She's going to help run the show in the background. Um, we're also joined here by our special guest, uh, Laura. Laura is the founder of Student Reader, and you're going to be hearing a bit more about that. Laura, do you want to just give a quick intro? I remember you and I were chatting about... Uh, how frustrating you found it when especially you saw the shift from physical books which were really expensive Laura works has worked in uh, university publishing and bookstores seeing students buy these hardcover books hard books that are expensive and then suddenly getting ebooks which were expensive and even, they got even less from it Can you would just sort of tell a little story what what frustrated you there and and the kind of the beginnings here sure sure um so first of all my name is Laura Bergioni and I've worked in um um, a community college campus for 18 plus years, uh, managing auxiliary services uh, with a big focus on, um, on our bookstore. Um, and before the pandemic, we were able to help create these programs that were tackling some of our students' insecurities. Uh, and the biggest insecurity is the cost of our textbooks and course material. Um, but since the pandemic, a lot of our funding has been, has gone away. Um, so it kind of left this void, and um, that's why I started Student Reader, um, because of um, the high cost of textbooks. And, you know, we, we've got these different modalities now of ebooks and, and inclusive access, uh, but students still don't own their digital content. Um, your device does. Um, so that's why Student Reader was born. Uh, we're hoping to change that. Yeah, I remember you and I were chatting and, you know, I've got, I probably kept, I don't know, five, 10% of the books I bought when I went through engineering, um, if that many, but I remember selling the books and still getting, you know, some cash. I, it was beer money for me at the time. 
but it was <laughs> really expensive. Um, and I was surprised when you mentioned, you know, that, that they'll, that there's something that maybe the audience doesn't get this, that eBooks, you don't own them. So you can't, Your device does. You can't give them. No. Right? So mm -hmm. that must be frustrating to see that. It is. It is very frustrating. Um, so, you know, that's why minting NFT books is, is it, I, I think it could change education, the way, you know, course materials are delivered. Um, you, you do, when, when you have an NFT, you do, you can resell it. Um, and you, you can set your price. Um, and if you don't get that price, then you don't have to sell it. Um, you can gift it to another student. You can gift it to a friend. Um, you can just let a friend borrow it if it's something that you want to keep, you know, that you need throughout your career. Um, I just think, I just think NFT books is, is really going to change the way we view course materials. I think it's also interesting as well, as I looked at how Student Reader and the ecosystem spun up, and we'll talk about that's what we're here to talk about, how the NFT started to play a different role as well, in that you can use an NFT as a gateway to say, hey, if you have this course material, welcome to the course. If you don't have the course material, maybe you see a different part of the course. Maybe you're missing some pieces and or they just say, hey, listen, you're auditing the course. Hey, perfect, great. But at the end of it, you maybe don't get the same credential or something, but at least they know you have the material and can in some ways follow along as you read through and stuff. But let's jump in and, and, and start going through. So what we're gonna cover off is really two things um, at the same time. This is kind of the theme of the, of the Oscars, I guess, you know, everything everywhere all at once, which by the way, Laura, I think it was you and your boyfriend who convinced me to watch that show and I'm still not sure I should have. Um, <laughs> the finger thinks it was a little, little weird. <laughs> Um, but we're talking about two different things. One is a decentralized education project, which education is a massive space. We'll talk about that. But also the tooling of how did we do this? Because one of the questions we get asked at Continuum Loop a lot is, how are you doing this and how can I apply it to my own project? Certainly we're there to, to provide the services for projects that want to bring us in. But we also want to make sure that other folks are able to do this. We're going to be showing a little bit of two, those two things. Laura's project with Student Reader but also how did we apply these tools? So Continuum Loop, what we work on is decentralized ecosystems. We work in places where there's no point to control. And we're talking about this one today, which is education. Education is absolutely mammoth. This diagram you're seeing on the right, we're gonna talk about this a fair bit, where we talk about ecosystems and arenas and interactions. I'll explain that a little more later. Education is an absolutely enormous and very convoluted ecosystem. Every country in each country, typically there are, are in the US, there are states, Canada, we have provinces. That's where the mandates of, of, of education come and they even get lower down into school boards that are below there and they're different. There's so many players, there's literally billions and billions of dollars, if not trillions going through these education systems. And frankly, we're not seeing a lot of great results. It's being disrupted. We've seen, for example, the value of a degree decreasing. A degree used to meant you get a job. You spend literally now hundreds of thousands of dollars in the US, similar numbers in Canada, to get a degree, you walk out of university, college, and suddenly you, you realize it really meant almost nothing. Most of the degrees aren't, aren't doing what they used to do. But perhaps more important is we're all recognizing that we never stop learning. And how do you share that learning when you realize these micro credentials, these nano credentials that you can get, these small courses that can make a really big difference um, are really helpful. They also make a huge difference in areas where there's less formal education, less opportunity. I've worked on a project with uh, some of the uh, Ministry of Education folks in, uh, in Ethiopia, for example. Um, they're working to one, recover an education system that was destroyed by civil war, but also making sure the long-term goal is that those students in that country have opportunities around the globe that are equivalent to folks that are growing up in North America. So I want to back up to, you know, kind of where did this start? Because I was involved in a different part of the project. The part that, that, that Laura's going to talk about this, this you'll hear the term course reader. We'll, we'll get to that in just a moment. It's not what I was working on. It was part of the, the, the head of product at a client was basically saying, hey, we need to create this course because we need to educate our community. It's involved in the Cardano community, which is a very rich community of developers, architects, people who are really excited about, you know, changing some of the foundations of the internet and how things work. And they wanted to teach about decentralized identity, which is our space. 
We've been deep in decentralized identity before it was called that, before it was called SSI, self-sovereign identity. So all these pieces we've been involved in, but they wanted to create a, a learning program so that people would say, what is decentralized identity? And then you build the technical blocks as well as the user experience blocks on top of that. And how hard can this be? I've done education courses, sort of. Um, every course really needs training material. I really never understood. So that basically, hey, here's the manual, here's the training document and stuff like that. Turns out, much like everything in life, um, a lot of things we work on are extremely complex. There's a lot to them, but they come across as very, very simple. It turns out this course reader thing, this was a, a beautiful document that was created. I thought it was, yay, how hard can it be? Laura, can you give me an idea of, of what a course reader can be? Because I had no idea how complicated they could be, but you jumped in and helped because you'd seen this. And, and honestly, th this is one of the parts of the problems that, that, that we find, Christine and I have the same issue with Continuum Loop, is that when we know our topic really, really well, it comes across as, well, everyone must know this. But the depth <laughs> of knowledge that you brought to things of the sort of complexities of how this could be, um, Again, I thought it was simple, it's not. So you helped prepare this reader. One was physically beautiful, but can you explain sort of the, 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 all the steps that are involved, especially that copyright and licensing side of things? Yeah, so um, within our college campus, we also have instructors that create course, course readers. We call them course readers. Um, what they do is they, because they're subject matter experts in their field, they can, you know, come up with um, with their content, but they also sometimes they'll use content from um, traditional textbooks. So when you're using content from textbooks, you have to have copyright clearances. Um, you know, if you're using a certain certain percentage of that textbook, you have to make sure that that the author is going to allow you to use that content. So the biggest and most important thing is to get that copyright clearance. Um, and then, you know, just making sure that you go through the material, you edit it, you, you know, we had for this particular uh, reader, we had um, people go through it and edit it. We made sure that we were clearing all the copyright. Um, and then to create this, you know, nice looking book, we had, we had to figure out how to bind it, how to print it, um, what what would make it look and feel like a, a, a course material, like a textbook, like a something that could be used for a course. Um, so, I mean, I'm kind of just simplifying it a little, but it, it was it was a couple of months of going through it and working through it um, well, I, to get what we have now. <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, I can imagine the, 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 the I, I, uh, this is how naive I am. I, I know there's a thing called a fair use clause, but I know that yes. it's ambiguous what is fair use. But but mm -hmm. when you said you, you have to get the, the, the author's clearance you get a clearance from the author to say hey you're allowed to use this do they also get paid oh absolutely so so that's part of the copyright clearance uh, we need to make sure that um the the person who created the content that you're using is getting their royalties um and that's what the copyright clearance is um you know you tell them how much of the book you're using um and then they charge you per, per page um to use that and you have to make sure you're paying it cool uh, it's interesting on that. Uh, one of the things uh, Christine sends out a monthly newsletter from us last month was, uh, I think it was last month, Christine, where we did choke point capitalism, which is a, uh, really, yeah. it was last month, which yeah. is a really interesting book for folks. And this kind of fits in. I didn't think about this until just now. Poor Laura is hearing me just extemporaneously make stuff up. <laughs> but choke point capitalism is about the, the, the machine behind whether it's music or whether it's a movie, screenwriting for TV, uh, books, about the machine behind that is about how do I get my copyright license and who gets there once you pay that license, the publisher or the holder of the copyright, who then gets the distributions. Very interesting because it turns out the authors get almost nearly nothing, but separate, I've jumped, jumped topics here. Mm -hmm. So it was really interesting for me to see this, 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 this reader drop. Um, to know that one, it was compliant. It was actually meeting the needs because it's you need to be fair to the people who are producing this content. Decentralized identity is a particular space where there's a lot of different players and stuff like that. So having uh, Laura help and student reader help on, on that was really neat to watch. Again, we weren't really involved in that. Um, 
but also to see that physical product that was delivered, um, the amount of pride that the team had. This, the product is called the Tala Prism. It actually just last week uh, went to uh, version 2.00 uh, on, on, on beta with the actual environment. That's why I was involved was to help get that launched. But to see the team's excitement about the physical product that they could hand out to students, they could hand out as almost mar- was really marketing material because it taught the people, but it was beautiful, but also the PDF. And now we're sliding into this world of, okay, cool, you got a PDF, but what if you had this, this NFT version of that? What does it enable? We'll talk a little bit about that as I go ahead. Because part of the problem behind this, the, the, the driver for the, this reader and the courses that were, that were driving was really to drive adoption. The Itala Prism product itself is, is a next generation decentralized identity, SSI, if you want. Um, we just don't use the term self-sovereign mu- that much anymore. It's more decentralized identity and, and trusted data. In order to drive the adoption, people have to understand, you know, what is it, what's different about it, because digital identity is kind of nerdy and, and it really doesn't work well on the internet right now. So people are like, well, why would I want to use that? So a bigger problem was also that the team was really, really busy and focused. The laser focus that the client had on this project of getting the product launched was absolutely the number one. And really there were no number two priorities. Um, so they didn't really have the time. So that's where the community now is taking a look at how do I blow up? How do I take this reader? How do I take this course that's there and actually distribute it? How do I incentivize people? So what was really cool to see is, um, Laura, you were, you, you were mentioning this, you're probably a better storyteller on this because you were there. Um, there were two conferences almost back to back. I remember hearing about them because I was, in, again, involved on other things, getting the product launched. But there were two conferences that kind of jumped in. One was CNFT Con, and the other one was Rare Bloom. Both of these are Cardano things. But maybe you could tell a little bit about how you managed to rally a whole bunch of pretty different folks. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, I have to give credit to Bookio. Um, when I saw what Bookio was doing, you know, giving us giving people back their ownership of their digital material, I thought again this could change education. Um, so I thought, you know, let's, why don't we mint um, course readers as NFTs and, you know, give people their, you know, give, give people ownership again. Um, so going to NFT, to CNFTCon, my goal was just to kind of meet with Book.io people, see if this was a viable thing, if we could, if we could do that, if we could work together and, and, and uh, mint course readers. Uh, but once I got to CNFTCon um, and being around the Cardano community, which they are amazing, um, I started to connect with other people. And we started talking about, um, you know, minting the NFT and creating a scholarship fund. And I kind of went from just, you know, minting course readers to minting course readers and, and funding a scholarship and you know, using oracles and, and SSI and smart contracts. And it was, it started to become really interesting and fun. And, and I started learning a lot more. Like I have no technical background whatsoever, uh, but, you know, just meeting with them and, and talking to them, it became like this real viable thing. Um, and then going to Brer Bloom, I started to connect with um, educational institutes and you know people that had mentorship programs within the Cardano community. And really that's when the learner to earner um, program started. Like we were we're setting up a path for students to you know help fund their education. Um, we connect them. We with, with this funding, they can use it to further their education, to to pay for additional courses, and then get them to the point where they can become. They can be teamed up with a mentor and help them use that that education in in the real world. And then from that mentorship program, you know, hopefully we can onboard them into some kind of uh, professional platform that can help them, you know, get jobs. Um, so that's it just going to CNFTCon and Rare Bloom and, and talking to the Cardano community, it just became this huge project that um, that I'm just so proud to be, you know, to be a part of. Um, yeah. So so <laughs> sorry, I get really excited about it. <laughs> well no, and then that's the that's the key here is that is that 
And one, I think it's, it's really important that, you know, you, you, you mentioned you, you don't have a tech background. Um, often that's the more important and more powerful perspective that comes in because I, I, I didn't had no desire and I'm not a, I don't really like going to huge conferences, but the CNFT con really was a bunch of folks who at that point in time, the vast majority of NFTs are JPEGs that with, you know, yes, it's a unique JPEG and, and there's a lot of investment speculation. That's interesting in, in a very, but as an, as someone who builds ecosystems, someone who builds systems, I'm like, eh, whatever. <laughs> But I think you 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 kind of glommed onto it in the book.io was doing a classic. Uh, they're taking the Gutenberg press, the, the uh, off copyright stuff, and producing you know ha- various different uh, you know they have the monster series with uh, you know Jekyll and Hyde and all these things that are off copyright. So I started watching that, going, okay, that's interesting. See, the content is there, and I get a special cover, custom cover. That's kind of cool. But then watching, as you mentioned, you know, the, the part that the audience may not know is there's independent authors coming in now. So you have independent authors who are producing and publishing their material on chain. Their mm-hmm. books are being released as NFTs. There's an NFT reader. So they actually have like a, a little app that they can read things on. But that also means that the revenues from those sales, you know, the, a very large portion of it is going directly to the author. If you read that choke point capitalism, again, back to that book, you'll realize that most authors get almost nothing, like literally nothing. Versus you know, in the NFT world, they can get like very per- large percentage. I think it's, you know, well over half of the revenues versus in the Amazon Kindle world, it's a tiny, tiny, tiny percentage, single digits. But you also take the next level where where um, you're seeing the ownership of this thing, this this NFT. You're seeing the fact that someone is buying it and then can use it. It's like, okay, great. But then you connected the dots of, hang on a sec, this is also how we can incentivize or inspire, pay to inspire, whatever you want to call it, those learners so that they actually one can earn money while they're doing the scholarship. They can show that they've gone through the course and get more and more mentoring. If you show that someone's gone through the course, and we'll talk about the credentials that will fly after this, because it's not about NFTs at that point, it's about credentialing, the fact that I have completed a course. Um, my mentor or possible employers can see that I've gone through this stuff. So to me, it's really, really powerful that you've gone from a kind of a nerdy, nerdy, weird, speculative investment thing. You connected it to the world you're in, which is books. Um, and book.io helped there, but then you took it to the next level. That's really, to me, really powerful. So when you went in and trying to build this, this is a coalition, what we were looking at, and we've started doing this over the past, you know, month or two, you've been working on this for almost a year, I think, is that correct? Almost, uh, yes, almost a year. Yeah. So, and this is what always happens is you see these things that start to succeed and, 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 um, <clears throat> you, think it's overnight and you're like no it's been a, a year of work mm-hmm. um so here's what we've started to do you started to look at how do you take the course reader for educational material how do we turn that into and start to feed into scholarship funding so that the, any revenues from a course reader sale uh the minting if you want to get in the nft term but really the course readers are published and they're sold mm-hmm. just like in the real um just like when you're buying ebooks the difference being that the licensing is, is, is different and the ownership is, is now with someone. Uh, Nikki's asked a question, can you have a group ownership? Yeah, you can have a group wallet. There's nothing wrong with a group wallet um, in, the, in the crypto space. So a group could certainly own that. Um, you also get into this space though, and this is something that, that, that my client and, and, and I guess your client, they're getting into course and curriculum management. Not a huge topic here, but the approach that the Teleprism is doing is you must do a Teleprism 101, the basics, the decentralized identity basics, before you slide into one of two tracks. And you can do both tracks. One is the technical track. Here's the coding. How do you use an SSI, a decentralized identity agent? How do you issue and verify credentials? How do you hold them? The other is more of a user experience and design. How do you fit these things into your world? How do you make it consistent for users so that it's easy to use, but they understand what they're doing? How do you fit it into your business and your business model canvas and stuff? That's kind of the two courses that you have to have this early entry. Part of it is you have to have had the 
you know, have to have had the NFT, but then been issued a credential, a verifiable credential, which again comes into our decentralized entity realm that we have continued looping working on. But further, this whole coalition is to, is leveraging what we call a continuum loop we call systems of record. It's very rare for us to come into an area where it's, it's brand spanking new. There is literally nothing. That's not a very exciting space to actually work in. It's really, really hard to make any progress. So one of the questions that was going around was, okay, well, cool. How do you manage a bunch of students? How do you manage you know, the fact that I completed a course? Well, there's learning management systems out there that are already in place at many institutions. Um, Atala Prism actually uses a tool called uh, uh, Canvas. Canvas is one of the largest, it's open source and there's commercial licensing uh, for learning management system. It's one of the largest on the planet. It's used at, uh, uh, well, from K to 12, but a lot of higher education institutions um, use this as, as their system of record. This is how they manage stuff. What's really cool about that is you can take it, you can jump in and say, listen, we're not asking you to do a lot of new stuff. So an open source adapter was created that says, hey, if you're using Canvas and you have a course, here's the little module you drop in that will let you easily issue a verifiable credential that says, Daryl O'Donnell finished AP1. I should probably, I should take the course actually before I say that. Um, <laughs> In, in, in theory, I could teach the course, but I probably could also fail the course uh, simultaneously. So it's kind of a weird place I'm at. So one of the questions I had for you, Laura, is you did some early work on the ecosystem side. And, and what I kudos to you for creating the early stages of governance frameworks, because you were able to go and talk to these various players, the publishers, the uh, uh, learning management folks, the post folks who had a course and had curriculum, the folks who were doing the minting and the NFTs, Folks that are doing the part of the thing you're not seeing here is the smart contracts that are in the background. The how do you manage a student uh, a student scholarship treasury? You were able to create a governance framework that started to do that, and then we kind of <laughs> stepped in. Do you want to just maybe get, tell us a little bit of how that how that kind of happened? Yeah, yeah. Um, so I get really excited about the minting of the NFT, but I also what, what student reader is doing is. Um, with the partnerships with our learning institutes, we are um, issuing student credentials. Um, so we identify um, for, for this particular um, program, um, we are we identify uh, we're identifying 100 students and issuing them a student credential. And in order for um, I was told in order for the community to, you know, really stand behind me, I had to create this governance framework, which I had no clue about. Um, took me weeks to even like wrap my head around it to even get started. Um, so we we created this governance framework um, to show people to to let our partners know that this is what um, this is how we were going to issue the credential. This is um, the criteria. Um, Sorry, I get. Um, yeah, sorry, I've distracted so, you. This, this is. No, no, no. I, was, I was trying to grab a book, Laura, because <laughs> what you just said about governance frameworks is is there's a book I have. It's called uh, One for Many. Um, D. Hawk was the founder of Visa. Um, Christine, we'll 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 make sure it's it, it, people get a, a a link. Can you find a link, perhaps, and put it in the chat for what? Uh, yeah. For many from D, by D. Hawk. I was fortunate enough to work on a, a, a project with the U.S. credit unions, which was the first operational deployment of SSI decentralized identity. And D. Hawk was one of the advisors. The reason I raised D. Hawk is what people don't understand about governance frameworks is it's how the world works. When it's codified, the if you look at something like Visa, MasterCard, and Amex, everyone talks about in the crypto space, at least, everyone talks about Visa and its transactions per second is the thing. It's not. That's technology. It's just technology. Um, getting to transactions per section, it, it second is totally doable with technology. The real asset, and they have some magical tech at Visa, MasterCard, Amex, and all of the other networks. The magic behind it, the real IP that if they got rid of it, they would fail as a company is their governance framework. A vendor knows what happens when I pull out my Amex, that they, they'll get paid on a certain time frame. If there are issues, here's how chargebacks work. There's a ton, ton of rules, and, and they know where they fit into the ecosystem. So when you were able to go out and talk to folks and said, here's a governance framework, hi, I'm a registrar. You're like, 
Okay, great. You issue student ID credentials. You want to be in control of that. That's your job. Here's how you fit into the ecosystem. And here's how your student ID credential is used, not abused. It can only be used in X, Y, and, and Z or Z for the Americans and Canadians um, in these particular ways. This is what the government's from, and this is where we came in and basically started to help because you started it off and you did an awesome job. Somebody just asked a question here. Did you present the idea for one of the great publishing houses like Oxford and similar players? I think right now we'll talk a little bit about that in the future, but without a robust governance framework, you can talk to your close friends. When I say friends, I mean the colleagues you've met at CNFT Con and Rare Bloom and say, here's the idea I'm working on. Does this make sense? Here's where you fit into the ecosystem. But the next level of going to an Oxford or some large organization as a publishing org, as a large institution that is that is uh, managing many, many students, we're going to need just the next level, which is where we kind of stepped in and said, hey, we can help with that because the project is we're learning, we're applying this framework that I'll speak a little bit more about shortly. And it's a great example of one that's relatively lightweight, but it needs that rigor. And we can help to that. So that's what Christina and I kind of kind of jumped in. So I'm going to jump ahead a little bit here and talk about what it is that Christine and I are doing and show you how we did a couple of these things, how we're taking this huge ecosystem and breaking it down. But we're taking a look a little bit more deeply at the ecosystem. See, who are the players? Because when you're dealing with small institutions, small groups, you end up seeing, okay, cool. This is what they do. It's actually, there are actually three different things. So a small learning institution, if you take, for example, the, um, who's the, the, the education partner? I know Itala Prism runs its own EP 101, but there's education partners who we were looking to work with. Can you give one of the examples, Laura? It's the grouping. Um, oh, one of the, um, sorry, P uh, Power, Learn, Power Learn Project, sorry. Yeah, Power Learn Project is, is a small group where they're looking to take a small cohort. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit like a couple hundred, a hundred or so students and push them through. When you're dealing with an organization of that size, the roles in an ecosystem get blurry because they're managing all of their students. They're managing the actual course. They're testing the students. They're saying, yes, you graduated and they're issuing a diploma. Those roles may be, may be, it may feel like it's one because it's really one person. There's maybe three or four or five roles actually there that if you don't separate them in the ecosystem, if you don't separate them in the governance framework, things get confusing really, really quickly. So this is what we're helping with Laura and, 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 and the student reader crew and the broader ecosystem because education is enormous. So jumping back, we work on decentralized ecosystems. If you look at, at education, it's enormous. We break them down. I mentioned this earlier from an ecosystem level where we have literally hundreds and hundreds of players. We'll break it down into an arena. How do we do a learning to a learner to earner type of system where you're locking, you know, talking about tens of players, still quite a bit, but really it's the interactions that we can actually start to chip in on and say, okay, who is doing what to whom? Um, what are the ramifications if I get it wrong? If I register a student and issue a credential to them, are there any liabilities I'm taking on? And if there are, am I okay with that? There's nothing wrong with liability as long as you know what it is. Um, that you can value it, that you can indemnify if necessary, or you can move the risk to someone else. It, liabilities are everywhere. So we take a look at these, breaking it down from the big ecosystem, and I'll show you the example in a moment, to an arena or arenas. M many projects we work working on, we end up with many different arenas where they could play. Um, and then those breaking down those interactions so we really understand who are the players in the ecosystem that need to be governed. So those arenas and interactions are absolutely critical. And this lets us get to those key players. You know, who are the key players or components? So in the case of Student Reader, we've got um, people, we've got, you know, students, we've got uh, people at organizations, and we have on-chain stuff. We have components that are running all automatic, um, and we need to understand who they are, what they're playing. Um, additionally, what are those signals we need to make sure that, that the ecosystem is growing? This is something for the longer term of Student Reader and its, earn, its uh, learners or earner ecosystem. How do we maintain and monitor it? But let's make sure we understand those players. And this is where we get into education is absolutely enormous. Um, this is just a quick diagram. I'll show you a better one in just a second here. And again, that industry, as I mentioned, is shifting. This uh, learner to earner concept is everywhere. One of the groups we advise, I'm on the board of advisors for the Learning Economy Foundation. 
one of the things they're looking at is how do we really enable the skills gap that exists that employers want they need people to fill these skills gap but the students don't know they exist how do you start to make this happen but also can you do this in a way that you know small small credentials not a four-year full degree program or something like that I mentioned earlier that you know the value of degree versus the cost is really dropping you're not getting the bang for the buck of spending hundreds of thousands of dollars you can run the numbers and says you know one depending on what career you're in you'll never pay it down you will never recoup your investment of education something is wrong what people are recognizing that lifelong learning is critical so the shift that student reader is working on is really really important so we looked at this ecosystem which is again enormous um, <clears throat> on the right side we got a whole section here just quickly rip through this. So you have employers who have this skills gap that i mentioned they know that they have job openings that map to the skills gap they have job applications learners need to find out about these opportunities to learn we have identity but on the one side we looked at okay what is student reader working on and it's really the scholarship space so we actually took a look at that individual ecosystem to say what are the pieces um, and there's lots of different things this is what we call an ecosystem scan so we're looking for things that are Componentized utilities, routine things. This is where Italo Prism comes in. It is aimed to become a utility that folks use. But then you have where are these points of concentration? Learning management systems are absolutely critical when you're in any real heavy education. When I say heavy, it could be a course or two um, type of a system. We also, though, separate it out. And this is where one of the key things we've learned is that the learning management system is critical. But the registrars are slightly different. They're part of the, of the educational institution, but if you treat them the same, they're different beasts. And that was really important for us. And then we get into the governance frameworks and the trust registry, but all the pieces that are moving. I get a course completion credential. I have a student ID credential that's issued. Um, that is then used later when I apply for a scholarship in the case of student reader. I have to have that proof that I am a student of the, of the PLP, the Power Learning Program or project. I have completed the course. That now means I'm eligible to apply for a scholarship. The scholarship smart contract is really an oracle can actually say, did you do you have the student ID? Does it match your student your, your course completion credential? Your names match? Perfect. You are eligible. It now triggers off a contract and takes money from the treasury and awards it to the student. This is the main flow of things. So when we looked at that main flow, it's still a lot of pieces. We looked at, okay, cool. Um, the market has said there's a skill gap. I have this earner to learn. I have this NFT where I can own my reader, but how do we incentivize this scholarship concept? You, you've talked a little bit, Laura, a, a little bit about the scholarship idea, but when you started talking to other folks beyond the, the, the CNFT con and rare bloom, where you got, honestly, you got a little bit nerdy on NFTs and where they can fit in the world. When you started talking to folks who were uh, more about the education side, what did they start thinking about this scholarship and earn to learn idea? Um, well, it, it's it's such a new concept that I don't think that the edu people in education really understand how it can change, um, how how it, they don't understand that it's a, it's an, another modality um, to offer to, to deliver content. Uh, right now we have, you know, eBooks, we have inclusive access, which is, um, um, it's, it's content that's integrated into LMS in our case at our community college through Canvas. Um, we also have uh, open educational resources, uh, better known as OER and um, ZTC, which is zero textbook cost. But with all these modalities and all these um, ways to help students save money. Again, students don't own the content. Um, they, they, it's their device owns it. So um, I, I think that NFTs in the educational space is is going to be a slow start. Um, but I think once people understand it, we'll start to see we'll start to see it being used. Um, Book IO is. I know somebody asked about working with publishers or I, I forget what the chat said, but uh, Book.io is, is currently working with Ingram, uh, which yep. is a huge publisher uh, for textbooks. So, you know, people are starting to see it and, and, you know, hopefully they'll start to understand it, but I'm hoping that student reader, um, once it's, you know, once it's launched and, and we're actually out there doing this, that people, see it as a, as a modality and maybe even a, a way to to do scholarships and 
you yeah. know, just have it open and, and, you know, doing scholarships this way, it, it there's more transparency. Um, you know, stakeholders can actually see where the money is going and um, see who it's, it's, it's helping. Um, so yeah, that's think, really my hope. Yeah. And one of the, when, when, when I, you know, I've only heard, cause I've not been involved in the, in the, in the, in the outreach, I've been involved again, again, that Patella Prism launched again, it launched last week. It's finally out. <laughs> but to hear the folks who were who do kind of get the idea, meaning there are groups out there right now, and we know that uh, that 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 uh, I'll, I'll probably get their name name wrong again. Power Learning Project. There are people funding that project right now, knowing mm -hmm. that there are skills gaps. They have a different goal. Their their goal is to is to enable and grow uh, skills in Africa. They're very active in Kenya right now. Um, but this aligns really, really well because they're already funding students. Now you have portions of this thing coming in. Hang on, there's a funding mechanism. There's a scholarship application mechanism with validation that you're really a student. So they start to get more rigor because you can just imagine a few years from now to someone saying, hey, listen, I was, you know, I, I started taking these courses not knowing what would happen. Now I've got a job and a career and here's what I'm really doing. And you can say and prove that you actually did that. And they can say, yep, I actually here I'll prove it. Signed and it said, I came through the power learning program. Here's what I did. And by the way, my mentor to help me here and my employer found me here. That's where we're going to. But like many visionaries, Laura, you're you're seeing that that future. It's it's the, the chipping away at the small pieces. So that scholarship piece was really, really key. So um, can, can I say one more thing? Oh yeah. Uh, sorry. sorry. Um I, I'm people in the traditional educational world don't really understand it or see it. People in this space and this technology space are, are, are excited. Um, I have, you know, different, I've been talking to different educational institutes that, you know, are on the Cardano, I, I, that, that are in the Cardano community and they are excited. Um, I already have different institutes that want to work with us, but I'm like, let's, let's just make sure that this, this, this works. Like let's, I, I I want to be very confident going into it and, and I'm confident now, but I want to see it in action and then, you know, grow, grow it. So, you know, we do have educational institutes that, that understand it and see the value. Awesome. And that's how, that's how real movements start in, in, in my view. I'm going to start burning through some slides because we are running down and we do have a whole whack of questions and comments. And apparently you need to beat me up because Nikki has made comments, but uh, uh, I'll jump to that. And I actually recognized that Nikki yesterday. I was like, oh, crap. <laughs> um, so so we went through and did a, started doing an arena scan. This is another level of detail where we start doing the interactions. Again, I'm not going to dive in on deep on this right now. But again, our key role was to identify, our key job here was to identify those key roles and capabilities so that we can take the early, the, the initial governance framework and, and recast it to focus in on those ones, the roles that are absolutely critical for adoption and try to simplify it, but also split the, the framework apart because it's also the current governance framework is doing two things. It's being managed on how do I use my courses, this AP 101 course being required to enter the next level courses. That's nice, it's important, but that's an internal learning institute thing versus the outside world really doesn't care other than oh that's nice to know that AP 102 you had to do AP 101 but it's not a requirement for them to to uh, manage that to to gate that that's the institutions thing so we're separating a few things out the goal here is we want to get down to simple so these ecosystem scans and arena scans really lead to what we call a minimum viable ecosystem what's the bare bone start so that Laura you can point at something so that when you take institutions that are not thinking about this crazy new future, you can point them out and say, see where you fit? And be like, oh, right. And it's easy to approach. If you make something convoluted, there's there are no examples of complex ecosystems. I got a little thing down the bottom that the complex ecosystems cannot be designed. They simply can't. They emerge from a bunch of simple things and then you get complexity. If you try to design complex, you are going to fail just depends how much money you throw at it about how long it takes for you to fail. Again, we're going for that simple thing, that minimum viable ecosystem. I'm gonna rip through this real quick because what are these tools? Because I keep showing up these different tools and stuff. Is part of this thing we're calling the trust continuum. Um, it really just, it's a tool that helps us do what we've been doing for years 
And they came out of a really weird, I didn't realize that we have kind of a weird, weird past at Continuum Loop, where our careers started out and our history started out really building these life critical systems in search and rescue, both civilian and combat, um, emergency management, uh, multi-agency, where we had 700 agencies in Canada, the US sharing the simplest of information for crises. Um, Laura, your neighborhood is under this right now, roadblocks. Mm -hmm. Roadblocks mm -hmm. during a crisis on the level of Katrina, on a level of a local crisis is one of the number one problems because I need to be able to ask the following question. Great, the road is closed there. Okay, can I get an ambulance through? Will you let an ambulance through, yes or no? That has life, life consequences. The lessons we learned going through this weird history over, over literally decades is that everyone thinks they have control and that's not true. We rarely have the control that we think we do. It turns out the ecosystem we are in, they rarely ever had any control. The search and rescue, they beg, borrow, and steal resources to do the search and rescue stuff. Um, combat search and rescue is a little bit different. They have a little more operational control. Mercy managers have no resources, no money, no resources. And what's really interesting is it's all been decentralized and it's always been about ecosystems. How do I ask for something? How do you offer something? How do I how do I task you? How do I share information? We didn't realize that we were consistently in this weird world. So we realized in the last year or so, Christine has been helping me build up this framework. And we've been applying to clients all around the globe in various different forms in finance, both traditional finance, as well as through the DeFi crypto education. This is one of double projects, supply chain, um, governance, and, and even into the deeper crypto side of things, as they come to the realization that regulation is actually a thing that they do have to be concerned about. Um, what this has done, though, is allowed our approach to scale. Um, just folks who are out there, it's being released op openly, um, and it's really just tools and methodology. It goes from early stage through growth. This is a bit of a diagram on, on the thing. We'll, we'll, we'll happily share this out later. I'm just going to burn through because we only have 10 minutes left. Um, and we did a small portion of it here. We really worked on two, three different things. The ecosystem scan and arena scan to make sure we understand who the players were, what they're doing with each other and helping beef up the, the ecosystem governance framework that, again, Laura has already got a great start on. We're just going to bring it up to the next level. Laura, I'm really excited to kind of we'll close off with this and jump into questions, which I this can be interesting. I'll probably just read through the <laughs> chat while you maybe talk a tiny bit. So maybe tell a little bit about, you know, what's coming next quarter, because it, I'm really excited to hear that Student Reader is launching. Um, and, and that's amazing to, to me. Yes, yes. So um, we will be launching, we will be minting our NFT um, in the next quarter. Um, uh, we've, we've ident we're identifying um, students, um, 100 students from the Power Learning Program. Um, we're going to be issuing them, you know, student credentials, um, airdropping them the NFT, which the NFTs are, I, I've looked at the at the um, covers and they just they're they're so beautiful they they look amazing um we we um yeah we're gonna airdrop them nfts we're gonna have them go through the ap 101 course um issue them a student credential and you know fun give them their scholarships it's yeah and, and to, to me that what i really i mean there's there's a level at which you know you, somebody could have just written a check and just done this right what I really like about this is you're taking a look at the big picture, and this is where we, where we jumped in. I mean, it, 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 to say, listen, we need to make sure that governance is nailed, so that instead of doing just one off AP 101, that AP 101 is just one of many, so you can work with many more wildly different areas, whether it's related to the Cardano community or whether it's related to I'm learning Spanish. Um, from a different institution, and I want my employer to see that I have the credential that I got from a high-level Spanish training. No, I don't speak Spanish. Um, <laughs> to me, that's, that's really, really exciting. Um, yeah, we've, we, we've got this NFT in different languages. We're starting to, you know, look at look at this that's in globally. Spanish and Swahili, Swahili, and I believe Japanese as well. So. Yeah. You know, we're we're thinking maybe El Salvador for Spanish. You know, places that are that that are using cryptocurrency within their you know ecosystem. That you know, so that we 
because because this is all cryptocurrency, our scholarship. Um, so we need to be able to uh, fund these students and have them be able to use that fund. Um, so yeah, it's really I'm I'm really excited as to where this can go, and and I'm excited to have more people contact us and and work with others. You know, you know we're working with the Tala Prism right now, but. Um, we're, we're talking to other institutes and having their course readers, you know, their subject matter experts create content for us to be able to mint and keep funding scholarships. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's really exciting. Awesome. I'm going to jump into some of the questions. Actually, I looked at the, the most recent chat came in because it actually covers off my little last bullet here that I wanted to, to, to jump into. The question is, do we have something on the self sovereign identity side of things? What I find really interesting about this project is it is anchored to self-sovereign identity. It's just SSI, decentralized identity is not front and center SSI because SSI. That's what all too many projects, we typically get brought in. If a project is failing, that's one of the reasons it's failing is they're talking about decentralized identity as the problem and the solution. It's not. The identity is always an enabler. It's always enabling something. But what's actually interesting is this whole solution. So when that scholarship application comes in, I have to prove as a student that I have a student ID verifiable credential. That's SSI. I have to prove that I'm holding a course completion credential. That's a verifiable credential, again, SSI. So now I have to have these two verifiable credentials, which may come from two or th one or more issuers. And now it's using a smart contract and chew through and they say, hey, great, we've done a verification of those things. Everything checks out. Here's your scholarship funds. Off you go. So SSI kind of disappears into the background. I'm going to stop sharing here now because Christine, remember, I, I asked her to make sure oh, but I, I lost my chat um, and, and go through. I'm just going to rip through some of these questions because we've had them flying in. Um, yeah, we have a lot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, where do you want to start? I want um, to start with one, two from Nikki. If, if, if you mind, if I, I'm just going to jump in, Christine, because it's we only have. Seven yeah, go minutes. ahead. Because yeah, Nikki is asked. So if someone has doesn't have the course material, and they are then they are ramped onto the scholarship fund. So what happens if I don't have the NFT, but I want to get into the course? How do I get that NFT? If I if I mean, let's say I'm a student, I don't have whatever. I don't know what the price is. Forty ADA. Or something so that's about mm -hmm. what uh 10 15 dollars usd to buy the course how am i how are you how are you bootstrapping that i think there's an air i think there's a the, the course program itself is doing that right yes so so for the students with the student credential we're airdropping them nft so they don't have to buy the nft um these identified oh. students get the nft for free so that gotcha. they're able to to go into the course awesome awesome and then uh, Nikki also commented, says, Laura, you should have connected with me. Please beat up Daryl. Yes, I, I'm going to get some beats. Um, and I was actually going through, there is a project Nikki has been involved with, as have some of the Atala Prism team in a prior life. Uh, Yoma is a team, is a project that is about youth in Africa that is about mm -hmm. learning to learning. It is about volunteering opportunities, and it is a fantastic thing. And Nikki, I was actually looking at that a couple of days ago when I was asking you that person's name. I'm thinking, I need to connect these two together. But one of the things we're also trying to make sure is that Student Reader is doing that minimum viable ecosystem to get started. But now the question is, and then where does it go next? And that's definitely mm -hmm. one of the areas there. I mean, and yeah, Laura will, uh, if, if Nikki doesn't see me first, Laura will hit me in the head or something when I see her. Um, yeah, so Neil Thompson shared out the KORC organization, the one from many. Uh, that, that's a fantastic one. Now, Nick Nafak, how do we ensure the integrity of the roles in open governance framework? How do we know that systems of record are providing authentic documents? How will other stakeholders be able to verify that authenticity? It would seem the way to broker certified doc would be need to exist. Um, yeah, Nick, there's a, quite a few questions in there. What we're looking at with this minimum viable ecosystem approach with, with, with student reader is, Let's get the bare bones going. We know we have a partner who is who is trying to scratch their own itch. They are funding this power learning program. They want to have students go through a course. They didn't have anything particularly identified. Now we've got this reader they can bring in and do the AP 101 course. 
We already have a mechanism by which a, a completion credential, this is not a certified knowledge test. So it's a light bar to hit. So that we can start the flow of things because the next question is, okay, great. All I have is a course completion credential. Perfect, mm -hmm. it's a start. If I want to get to the point where I have to reach a certain, you know, score of expertise and I want a level of assurance that that student has reached this and that we have vetted that is Daryl O'Donnell. It is not someone posing as Daryl O'Donnell. You start to ratchet up the governance requirements to get in, in which point you start to impose consequences. What you've done at that point is started out with a very basic ecosystem and you've grown into a much more uh, real and rigid, uh, real is wrong term, a much more rigid ecosystem. The question we have, the, the approach we're taking is, Let's not get rigid before, you know, we don't want to stifle and smother the baby. The baby is just learning to not even crawl yet. Let's make sure that that is a real need because right now people need to earn, they need to learn, and we want to make sure that they're doing that as opposed to you need to get to this rigid specification. But the answer to your question on each of those, Nick, is that if you need to get to that, that veracity, to that level of assurance, you put in tighter governance. One of the things is, as one of the founders of, uh, of Trust Over IP, that's what we do over there. Um, you can bring in the auditors. You can bring in the, here's the specifications, the conformance criteria. An auditor comes in and says, yes, you do meet the criteria, or no, your systems are insufficient. You're allowing um, fraudulent students into the system and or fraudulent issuance of credentials. You need to build that momentum in the ecosystem itself in order to get there. And yeah, you know, there's lots of different ways to do that. Um, Nikki commented on separation of powers. Yeah, it's the, the, the beauty of what Laura has done with the student reader team and, and the community that's around it is you got some nimble folks who were doing and wearing many hats. You know, the power learning program is, 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 is registering their students. They're, they're, you know, making sure they're doing the registrar role as well as the course management role, the, the curriculum role. If you don't separate those to next point, you can't get to the bigger ecosystem because you've munged things together and a registrar will be like, I don't pick the freaking curriculum. They're gone. When you deal with people in real operational communities, and Laura, you do this in the environment in the in the in the in the education space, you see the education is they don't get it. They just don't get it because they're looking at their very narrow lens. If I'm a registrar, I really don't care about the curriculum. Did you or did you not pass the course? That's my world. Are you or are you not this student? Are you alumni? Those are the simple questions they're asking, not the broad picture. Separating the roles is absolutely critical. Um, Michael Terrell has mentioned you should connect with the Trusted Learners Network. I believe they, some of them were either at CNFTCon, I believe they had a product from Itala Prism was actually talking uh, to the Trusted Learners Network. I think it was based, if I'm correct, Michael, out of Arizona or something. Um, there was a, there, there is definitely a linkage there. What's really cool is, you know, Nikki, Nikki has raised Yoma. It is scratching a very similar itch. Trusted Learners Network, scratching a very similar itch. Um, I'm on the board of advisors for Learning Economy Foundation, scratching a very similar itch. It's really, really, and, and Nikki's thrown out the term Internet of Learning. Absolutely. That's what this is all about. It's how do you build those simple and small systems, codify them, make them more formal as you need to, but don't again smother the baby. Don't make it so hard to approach it. It's going to take me six months of work to get started because I never will because I likely don't have budget for it. When you can plug into my existing Canvas system, my system of record, fit me in so I can sign on the dotted line for a very basic, lightweight, low consequence governance framework. I can then see the value, I can see it in use, and I will then start to step up to the next level of, okay, cool. We had a minimum viable ecosystem. We need to level up. I'm gonna start doing my degrees, my diplomas. I'm gonna start making sure that the professional accreditation bodies understand what those mean, as opposed to a relatively lightweight, you completed a course credential. But if you don't start lightweight, you'll never get started on this type of thing. Laura, we're at the top of the hour. Is there anything you would like to add? Just there's one question just popped in. I just did. Does anybody see a new question? Yeah, no, I'm just seeing. Oh, yeah. Well, we had oh, a couple just came in. <laughs> There's um, how to avoid uh, someone capturing the license material and um, share the NFT with someone else. So, so Lord, is that I'm not. 
Yeah, have a look in the, it's in the Q&A there. I'm not sure. Capturing license material and sharing to someone with NFT. Perhaps this person, an anonymous attendee, is, is talking about the, the right-click copy um, problem where, and this is something I can answer, because if the, the AP 101 course reader, the Itala Prison course reader, is on a particular NFT, is, is issued by book.io, it's very easy for me to go and copy the content. It's on chain. Make it myself and I can do the AP 101 as well. This is where you get into part of the governance and the trust registries that say, who are the real issuers of this thing? And if I have a tie that says book.io is the publisher of this NFT, and I have a tie that says over here, this is the power alerting program, and they acknowledge each other. It says, my publisher is using this did. I am this issuer of this credential, and it's tied to that. These two dids are tied. You end up creating a web of trust that the external right-click copy crowd, if you're in the NFT realm, right-click copy, basically rip off fake NFT, won't have. They won't have that web that touches the institution. They won't have that web that touches back to the student ID credential. They won't have that web that touches back to the valid, bona fide publisher list. It's going to be harder and harder as time goes on to do the fake publishing because there'll be nothing behind it. You'll look and say, okay, great. Tell me about your provenance. Oh, yeah, I got, I got nothing. So hopefully that answers that question. Okay, folks, we are, I think, out of time. Yeah. Uh, one quick, sorry, Mark just threw in a question. If I complete course A, then get completion credential in wallet one and do the same with course B in wallet two, and I need to prove I pass both, can I use one wallet? You could use one wallet, you could use two. It's gonna, your, your device is gonna get the question. You have to route the question if you use two different wallets. The question will come back, says, hey, your student ID credential is here, I need to see it. And I need to see your course completion credential. I need to see that whether it's one app or two doesn't really matter other than it's an ugly user experience if you have it spread across a bunch of different apps. All right, Laura, I've rambled on enough. What would your any, any closing thoughts? I, I just look for the mint. Um, yeah. Look on Book.io for the minting of the NFT. It's coming soon. Yeah, I've been watching the Book.io. Uh, I, I just uh, I like some of their um, especially the, the the Gutenberg stuff, because I, you know, used to download the text files and stuff, but I love the artwork and stuff, the way that they're operating. And also, they seem oh to be God. having a lot less problems than most of the NFT platforms out there, because they're, they're, okay. they need that rigor. They, they also, by the way, understand governance, because when they're working with those world sized publishers, if you don't have your governance correct, you're not working with them. <laughs> Mm -hmm. so, Laura, I want to just say a big thank you. Thank you very much for this. Christine, thank you very much for helping out. And for everyone who was on the call, thank you very much. And uh, everyone, keep being awesome. Thank you. Bye.